there's a theorem that has applications in algebra as well as along in calculus called the Intermediate Value Theorem that talks about a continuous function on a closed interval and looking at the y-coordinate at the left endpoint, the y-coordinate at the right endpoint, and the guarantee that if you pick any y-output between those outputs from the left endpoint and the right endpoint, and set your function equal to that number, that the x, or there will be at least one x in the interval for which running that x to the function would give that y output value. So in this example, we're going to lay out the wording of the intermediate value theorem and then show you how you actually do a specific example applying the theorem. So here the intermediate value theorem says if f of x is continuous, so remember that means that you can draw it without picking up your pencil, and it's a function, so it passes a vertical line test, on a closed interval. So a closed interval, because we have the brackets at each end of the interval, means that the function is defined at the left endpoint and the function is defined at the right endpoint. And k is any number between f of a, f of a is just the output when you run the number a through the function, and f of b, f of b is just the output when you run the number b through the function, so the endpoints of your interval. So that number k has to be a number between the output at the left endpoint and the output at the right endpoint. Then there exists, there has to be at least one c in the interval from A to B. So this notation is saying there's at least one value in that closed interval such that if you run that number through the function and look at the output, it will equal that K. So you're guaranteed at least one. So if you have those conditions met. So there could be more than one, but you're guaranteed at least one. And this is an existence theorem. It's saying, yeah, there is at least one, um, but it doesn't really give you a specific set of uh, ways that you could solve for this in any example, in every example. You just have to take the problems each at a, on their own merit and then try to see if you can find it. So in the example, it says, determine if the intermediate value theorem so IVT is just an initialization for the Intermediate Value Theorem, applies, and if so, find the C guaranteed by the theorem. So we're going to do two examples. The first one is f of x is equal to x squared plus x over x minus 1 on the closed interval from 5 halves to 4, and then it gives me that f of c is equal to 6. So first of all, I need to make sure that this function is continuous on that interval. So this function is a rational function. It's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. The only value of x that for which this function is undefined is x equal 1, because 1 minus 1 would give me a 0 in the denominator. Um, so this function is undefined at x equal 1, but 1 is not in this interval. 5 halves is 2 and a half to 4. So since 1 is not in this interval and this function is continuous everywhere except at x equal 1, this function is continuous on the closed interval. And we have brackets here, so I know it's a closed interval. Now I need to make sure that the k they're talking about, this 6 right here, is your k. So notice f of c equals k. So f of c equals 6. 6 is my k. I have to make sure this 6 is between the um, outputs of f of 5 halves and f of 4. So f of 5 halves is equal to 5 halves squared plus 5 halves divided by 5 halves minus 1. So that gives me 25 fourths plus 5 halves divided by, well, 5 halves minus 1, I can make 1 into 2 halves, so 5 minus 2 is 3 halves. And then to simplify this complex fraction, 
I'll look at the lowest common denominator of all the fractions, so it would be lowest common denominator of 4. I'll build this fraction top and bottom by 4 over 1. So that'll give me 25 plus, when I multiply 4 over 1 times 5 halves, that would be 20 over 2, which is 10, divided by then 4 over 1 times 3 halves, that would be 12 divided by 2, which is 6. So I have 35 over 6 is the value for f of 5 halves. Now f of 4 equals 4 squared plus 4 over 4 minus 1. So that's 16 plus 4 is 20 over 3, so that gives me 20 thirds. So when we think about this, um, my 20 thirds is 6 and 2 thirds, so 6 and 2 thirds, and then my 35 sixths is 5 and 5 sixths. So 5 and 5 sixths, 6 and 2 thirds, 6 is a number between those two values. So I've got a continuous function on a closed interval, and my 6 is between f of 5 halves and f of 4. So the intermediate value theorem does apply. So I verified it with each of those things. So next up, I want to find this C guaranteed by the theorem. So I'm going to take this function, x squared plus x, divided by x minus 1. And here's a tricky part. 6 is the output. And actually, for us to keep track that we're finding the values that make this true, they say f of c is equal to 6. So instead of writing x's here, we can write c's. f of c is just putting c's wherever the x's are. And that just helps us keep focused on solving for the value that makes it true. So then I have 6 on the other side. So 6 is the output. 6 is what that's equal to. Now we need to solve this for c, so we'll multiply both sides by c minus 1 to get rid of the fraction. So we'll have c squared plus c is equal to multiplying by c minus 1 and distributing the 6 through. You'll have 6c minus 6. And then it's quadratic, so we want to get everything on one side set equal to um, 0. So that's c squared minus 5 c plus 6 is equal to 0, and c squared minus 5c plus 6 factors as c minus 3, c minus 2. Is equal to 0. Set each factor equal to 0, c minus 3 equals 0, or c minus 2 equals 0. So that gives me c is equal to 3, or c is equal to 2. Now, I only want to report the c values that are in the interval of the x's. So k is an output value, but c is an input value. c has to be in your interval. Remember, this is 2 and a half to 4. So 2 is not in the interval from 2 and a half to 4, but 3 is in the interval from 2 and a half to 4. So my C guaranteed by the theorem is C is equal to 3. All right, let's do the next one. It gives me f of x is equal to x times the square root of x plus 3. Now this function has a square root with it, and so this function is only defined over the reals when you're taking the square root of a non-negative number. So we need to make sure that x plus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. Subtracting 3 from both sides, x has to be greater than or equal to negative 3. 
So this function is only defined for the x's that are greater than or equal to negative 3. So that would be our domain for that. Well, our interval, our closed interval, is from negative 1 to 2. And x being greater than or equal to negative 3, this span of x's from negative 1 to 2 are in the domain of the function. So the function is continuous over that closed interval. Now remember, the next thing we want to do, so it's continuous on the closed interval, k is a, any number between f of a and f of b. So f of a, f of negative 1, is equal to negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 plus 3. So f of negative 1 is equal to negative the square root of 2. What about f of 2? Well, f of 2 is equal to 2 times the square root of 2 plus 3, or 2 times the square root of 5. So negative the square root of 2 is about negative 1.414. And then 2 times the square root of 5, we have 2 times um, 2 point something-ish, so 4 point something-ish. And when you look, your output 0 is between those numbers. So 0 is between negative the square root of 2 and 2 times the square root of 5. So then that gives me k is between those. So now I'm guaranteed that there's at least one x for which my function square root x times the square root of x plus 3 is equal to 0. And remember, just to make it so we're focused on finding those c's in that interval, they have us put c in through the x's of the function. So c times the square root of c plus 3 is equal to 0. So now when I'm looking at finding this value, well, I have the multiplication of these two factors. And the multiplication of these two factors will be 0 if 1 of the 2 is 0. So if either c is equal to 0 or the square root of c plus 3 is equal to 0. So that gives me c is equal to 0, or square both sides and subtract the 3, c is equal to negative 3. But again, I only want to report the c that is in the interval of x's. And 0 is in the span from negative 1 to 2, but negative 3 is not in the span from negative 1. 1 to 2. So c equals 0 is our solution for that. Now just as a parting comment on part b, this is a theorem that's very commonly used to find an interval of x's where you can be guaranteed that there's a 0 to a function. So if you have a closed interval and the function is continuous on the closed interval, whichever way it goes, and if running your left endpoint through the function gives you one sign, so whether it's a positive or negative output, and the other endpoint of the interval run through the function gives you the opposite sign as that, well, zero is between the negative and the positive numbers. So if the outputs have switched sign, then somewhere in that interval, the function which is continuous, had to cross over the x-axis. So if it had to cross over the x-axis, it has to have an x spot for which running that through the function gave you a zero out for the output. And those x values are called zeros of the function. So if you have a function and a closed interval, and maybe they didn't even ask you that last part, they say, are you guaranteed there's a zero of this function in this closed interval? Well, what you would do is run the endpoint first, the left endpoint through the function, and see what the sign is. So this came out to be a negative number. 
run the, the right endpoint through the function and see what sign you get. And that one came out to be a positive number. And since the outputs of that continuous function switched signs, that means there's at least one x in that closed interval for which the function value comes out zero so that there's at least one zero in that interval.